today's episode of Still Be Determined, we're going to be talking about whether solar panels for your home are worth it or not. And as you probably can tell for regular listeners and viewers, I'm not Sean Farrell. I'm not the guy that usually does the uh, introduction for the show. I am taking first chair this week because Sean wasn't able to be with us, but I asked Ricky Roy from 2-Bit Da Vinci, good friend of mine, and we used to do vice versa together. I asked him to join me this week because he owns solar. He's had solar in his home for years out in California. I thought it'd be fun to have him on and he and I can talk about our different experiences with solar and to talk about whether it's worth it or not. So thanks for joining me, Ricky. Absolutely. Yeah. Matt Farrell, the, the less famous of the Farrell brothers. <laughs> the, less fair, the less famous Farrell. <laughs> That's me. It's good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a little while. Uh, it's been a while since we saw vice versa. I do miss it. So this is kind of like having a little bit of flashback for me right now. It's kind of fun. Absolutely. So, I think it's, yeah. So you had a chance to watch my video? Did you yep. have a chance to see it? And like, did you look at any of the comments? Because I was curious. There were themes that were p- jumping out at me. And I was going to d- toss a few of those out of like, one of the ones I saw the most was, what would it cost to remove panels when your roof needs to be replaced? That's like a common one. Do you see that kind of comment on your solar panel videos when you put them out? <laughs> well, well, that was phrased very nicely. I get usually a little more uh, nasty things yeah. about good luck when you're you know, roof has to be replaced and stuff. Well, the first thing you do is make sure your roof is good for 30 years before you get started. You yeah. know, if you're even halfway through like a asphalt shingle roof, it's, it's one of those things where you know that eventually you'll have to replace it. And that does come up uh, to replace it. It's really simple. Uh, obviously most people aren't going to be wanting to do it themselves, but it's really not a big deal. It just comes down to how much people will charge you. But I think if you plan appropriately, you could avoid a lot of that and, and just make sure that your roof is, is sound first and foremost. But yeah, I, I get that quite a bit. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I see it all the time and it's like you wouldn't be put, putting solar panels onto a roof that's 20 years old. It's like that would be, just be dumb. You should replace the asphalt shingles, then put your panels up and you're good to go. And like you said, it's like taking it down is not that hard. Like I, I was looking like Energy Sage has this great write up about, you know, it costs maybe two, three thousand dollars to pay somebody to take the panels down. You fix the roof and you put it back up. And the grand scheme of things over the amount of money that you're going to save from those panels over its lifetime, that's like a drop in the bucket. <laughs> so it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. I, I think it's not a, as a non-issue, but a lot of people still get hung up on it. Yeah, there was, there was a point when I took 12 panels off. It was kind of a science experiment. I had bought and I'd got used panels to test how, how well they performed after a very long time. And it took me like two hours to take them down. So if, yeah, $3,000 to take them down, maybe, I, maybe I'm the wrong business. Uh, that doesn't yeah. sound too bad. <laughs> Exactly. That's a, I'm that's curious, by the way, Matt. <laughs> I'm curious. You have an asphalt shingle roof, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. So, what was your thought process? How did you did you have to re-roof before you started? How did that all work out? Well, when we bought our house, the roof was brand new, and so it it wasn't that old when we put the panels on it. So it still had a lot of life left in it, and it was still in good shape. So I was comfortable putting them up, even though there was like I don't know seven years of life on them. So it was like they still had a good I don't know fifteen twenty years left. So I figured it's, it's going to be good enough. So we just put it on top. We've had no issues. In fact, the roof that's underneath the panels, if you look at them, they look great. It looks fantastic right. <laughs> in there because the panels are actually protecting the, the asphalt shingles. So it's, it's, I think that it's going to be totally fine. It's going to be totally fine. So in your, in your new house, what kind of roof would you go with? Have you thought we're about that go- yet? Yeah, we're going metal. I want to go with a standing seam metal roof because like everything I've read, it's like that's like the peanut butter and jelly for solar panels to a roof. Because they can clamp on the seams and you don't have to drill through the roof itself. And it's very easy to take them on and off. So I was thinking like that would be the best, best path forward, metal roof. What about you? That's absolutely what I want to do as well. But I'm, I'm a little concerned about the, the cost. So I'm, I'm trying to do this retrofit net zero build. So I have to really be conscientious of how much I'm spending. So uh, my only concern, and maybe I should just go get a quote and just just figure out how much it'll cost. But I'm I'm a little worried it'll be expensive. Have you gotten quotes and stuff yet? Haven't got quotes yet, but it's one of those. I've, I've seen things that say it's basically like twice the cost of an asphalt sing- shingle roof, but it's also like a 50-year roof. So it's like, if I put that metal roof on there, I will never have to touch it again. And that's, I'm planning on living in the house that I'm going to be building for the next 30 years. So it's like, I'm looking at this as I want to put one roof on and I never want to touch it again because I will be long dead by the time a desk is replaced. So I'd rather go standing seam. 
One comment I got recently on a video that I that I made was that, you know, the asphalt shingles, they're a petroleum product. So any rain yep. capture you have is going to have contaminants and stuff. So yeah. I'm not sure if there aren't filters to take care of it, but in comparison, a metal, a standing seam metal roof is just brilliant. You could probably just put a cup under it and just like, drink the water straight off of it. So it's actually more environmentally friendly. It's recyclable. You know what happens to asphalt shingle roofs at the end of their life? That's not a pretty picture, but no. metal, you could literally rip up a hundred years from now. I've heard of people with metal roofs that are 70 years old, like barns and stuff. And they're, exactly. they're made much thicker and better now. But at the end of it, you can just recycle it. So all around a standing seam metal roof, I think, is the perfect roof. And it's one I would love to do. We'll, we'll see. One of the questions that came up, I actually wanted to ask you specifically from Chris Farley. Um, I live in California and every year the fires have seriously lowered our solar production. I don't know how close you are to the California fires that have been happening because you're down in what, San Diego. I don't know. Have you seen any kind of impacts from the fires that have been happening in California? No, so I have 10 years of data from 2011 to 2021 before I moved. So in those 10 years, there, there, were, some, there were some periods of time when it was much shadier. But there's, first of all, there's no long-term impact. Like, uh, you know, a fire raging 50 miles from you is not going to, like, degrade your panels permanently. You might have lower output for a season, but you figure the, the winter comes, comes around, the rains fall, what little we get. And it should kind of reset. So I have seen months kind of like your video started with a, a very hooking uh, <laughs> attention grabber. You mentioned like this year you were off to a really bad start. And I was kind of curious what happened. Did I was actually thinking maybe a panel went down or an inverter went down, something like that. But it was just seasonal. It was weather, right? So I've seen weather trends, but there's, there's really no long-term impact to, you know, to the fires and stuff. But during the season when it's, when it's raging, it can be pretty like 20, 30% reductions are pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's, it, you actually just raised another thing that comes up a lot. It's like, how often do you have to clean it? And people ask me about dust on my panels, and I'm always kind of like, really? Is that is that a problem? Because for me, I, I unless we're in a kind of a drought period where there's not a lot of rain, I might get in the summertime pollen and dust buildup that you can actually see from the ground. And if that happens, I'll hose it off or get like a um, I have this like roof rake thing with a kind of a microfiber cloth in the end that I'll kind of like clean things off a little bit. I've done that, I think twice the entire time I've had them up because we get enough rain that it just kind of keeps it clear and it looks pretty good most of the time. I'm guessing where you are, that is a completely different thing. What, what's, what's been your experience with like dust and keeping them clean for production? Yeah. So for us, we can go, you know, usually seven months without any rain at all, which is brutal, right? Um, huh. And it, so it does get a little bit dusty, but in my testing, in my experience, I think typically three and a half, four percent is the difference between like a fl freshly clean panel and a slightly dusty panel. So it's not dramatic. Of course, if maybe, you know, if your angle of the roof is, is uh, shallower or you have really bad dust or pollen, a lot of trees, it could be worse, of course. But in my experience over 10 years, I found typically it was about 4%. So what, what I would normally do is, I mean, if you have a single story house, I think you, Matt, your house was two story, right? It's actually, a, it's a ranch, but the front yard is low. So that's like, it's got a, gr a basement. So it looks like two stories from the front and one story from the back. Okay. Well, if, I mean, a garden hose with a nice, like, you know, high pressured nozzle, you could probably just spray them really quick and yeah. it does a decent job. Obviously, if you want to get all the little bits and stuff and get it totally clean, it might be a little bit trickier, but my recommendation has always been don't hire a cleaner or anything. I, I think that completely defeats the purpose of solar. If you're paying somebody you know, I've seen some of these companies charging hundreds of dollars that kind of eats into your savings, which doesn't really make sense. And it kind of goes against the whole point. So I think, yeah, let nature take its course. And if you're really curious, get, get a high pressure nozzle and you can probably spread it up there and take care of it. Yeah. That does feed a question I have for you. What happened? Like you, you showed data kind of over the years and, and months and stuff, but like what happens in January when, when there's snow, do you have periods when you have no production? Oh yeah. Like there'll be zero production whatsoever. Um, it, January is De December and January are the worst two months of the year. If we have snow, the one thing that's interesting about snow is that snow does not like to stick to the panel. So it's like if we have a huge blizzard or something comes through and we got a foot of snow on our roof, it'll be there for 24 hours. But within 36 hours, that thing is sliding off the roof. And that's actually terrifying when it happens if you don't do it. I will go out there sometimes with the roof rake with this like, snow thing on it, and I'll kind of pull it off to manually control the fall. 
there are times where I'll be like sitting in my office and then I'll hear this deep rumble and it's like an avalanche that you just look out the window and you just can see all this snow sliding off your roof at once. So it's like the neighbors will still have lots of snow in their roofs, but mine will be completely clear because the solar panels don't like to have the snow on it. So it's, it's been interesting, but you're only talking about a couple of days where you lose production because it's covered and then it's cleared off and back to producing stuff. But again, it's December and January. Sun's low in the sky. You're not producing a lot of energy anyway. So it's, I'm pulling from the grid mostly in the, the wintertime anyway. Gotcha. I am also curious, do you have, I mean, you did a video recently. Do you have the data for what does a month of output look like in June or July versus December or January? Like what's oh, the yeah. delta? I'm curious. The delta is huge. Um, in January, I might be generating, I don't know, maybe 200 kilowatt hours max. It's really low. And in the summer, it's thousands. It's like I'm generating, you know, two, 3,000 kilowatt hours sometimes in the middle of July. So it's like I'm producing like twice to two and a half times more than I need in the middle of July. And then I'm producing this much in the middle of winter. Which is why, I'm, like in my videos, I always bring up like you gotta gotta look at this as a year kind of a thing. If you're obsessing about day to day, week to week, or even month to month, you're going to be disappointed. So for me, it's like I have to look at it from a yearly point of view. Otherwise, the winter would look like oh, it's not worth it. But it's like over the course of the year, you know, I've cut my electricity bill by almost sixty percent. So it's like for me, that's a win. <laughs> I'm totally happy with that. Yeah, and you, you got to factor too. If you're where you live, most people use natural gas for heating. Yep. I would imagine the electric usage is way higher in June. So oh, yeah. you're producing energy when people need it. And then you're kind of banking the credit at a time when there's probably less demand. So, I mean, it, it completely still does make sense. You're right. There's, yeah. there's, some, there's, a, there's a romanticism to being truly net zero, which is my goal, by the way. I don't know if it's even feasible. I think you need to have so much generation and so much storage that you could withstand several days of cloudy days or you know, other mm -hmm. conditions. But I think it's a, romantic notion but even if you can't quite get to that point which depending on where you live it's probably impossible there's yeah. still huge value to to going solar yeah it's like the new house i'm building i'm trying to make it net zero but it's gonna be net zero on a yearly basis i'm i'm definitely gonna be pulling from the grid in the middle of winter there's no there's no way around that for me but when you look at the collective amount of energy i will produce over the course of the year i will my goal is to have more energy produced than i'm using over the course of the year and most of that will come in the summertime late spring, early fall. And then the winter time, I'll just be pulling from the grid a little bit. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, you can still go net zero. It's just depending how, depends on how you're viewing it and what kind of lens you look at it through. There, there are ways to do it. That actually does make me think of one of the comments I see a lot, and I'm sure you've seen it a lot, mainly comes from people in Europe, Australia, outside the US. Why the hell is solar so expensive in the United States? And I get that so much and i saw a ton on this video too you went with used panels on your previous house which to me was brilliant because you probably saved a ton of money like and you installed them yourself correct yeah i did i did the second time i actually had a person who it was like a solar installer who was a friend of ours so he helped mm -hmm. us with like permitting and all the other stuff but in, in this next house i might potentially consider going fully diy but yeah the the, the costs are pretty wild. I mean, if you think about the average solar panels, like $300 or so per panel, it's probably a fair number. The micro inverter or inverter strategy is probably like $100 or $150, half, half of that. And then there's like the overhead installation permitting. I don't know, is, is permitting more expensive here? I can't imagine permitting is worse than Europe. Europe is even more highly regulated, um, but it could be. It could be the overhead for the installers or the size of the teams. I, I've never had a good answer for that. Uh, Australia especially seems to think we're just out of our minds because they're, they're paying less than half, a third what we yeah. pay. And so for them, it's much more of a no brainer, but here you're trying to sell like a $30,000 system to somebody who's you know retired or you know, on a tighter budget. Um, it could be tough and I, I'm not fully sure. I know the answer to why it is so expensive here, but I think there's bigger companies doing it or more overhead salesmen take, you know, a commission. Stuff yep. like that. Do you have a better answer for that than I do? I don't. My, my assumption's always been from the people I've talked to, it always sounds like it is the overhead of running the business. It's just like what salaries cost. You have all this staff. Uh, the, the marketing and sales strategy, we have to pay for all the marketing and 
the sales of getting new customers. It's like there's all of that overhead plus the permitting I know is expensive. I think that all of it collectively is what makes us super expensive here in the United States. I don't think it has to be that way. I think it's silly that we're that way, but it creates this perception that solar companies are deliberately gouging and increasing prices because the federal government's doing the 26% federal tax credit. So we can just jack the prices up even higher. And it's like, that is not what's going on from every person I've talked to, um, installers I've talked to. That is absolutely not what's going on, but it creates the perception that that's what's happening, which is interesting. It's frustrating. I don't know why it is. It's like it, there's in my mind, there's no excuse for it to be this expensive here in the United States, especially when you look at Australia. It's, it's so, it's so cheap. It makes me angry because everything's expensive in Australia except for solar. I don't get that. (laughs) I've yeah. So there are, there is some good news and I've thought about this a lot in California. They're talking about legislation that would potentially add line items for how big your solar system is. Those, those, um, those laws have failed, but I'm sure they'll come back. They'll, they'll tweak it and change things and, and try to run it again. But the rationale is so absurd, right? They're, they're, they want to charge you like, uh, let's say $5 per kilowatt. So you have a five kilowatt system, 25 bucks a month, just like if you're on vacation, you have your, <laughs> your breaker turned off and you go on vacation, you come back, you'll pay 25 bucks for nothing, right? And all that while your solar is actually producing them energy. So I have this kind of, kind of philosophy that one of the things that we could probably do is talk more about off-grid or non-permitted solutions. And I'm yeah. actually working with a company that's doing something really exciting. I'm looking forward to, to sharing more, but they have a really cool product that ties into your panel, measures how much you're using, and then their inverters talk to that and then just supply your house. You can get set up in a day you don't have to have any permits and stuff and no one would know you have solar. All they would think is you're not home. So it's like, oh, he's using 800 watts. A kettle just turned on. Okay. And the panels will just, you know, the inverters will just match your usage. And so to the utility, it's just zero, right? You're not exporting anything because as soon as your usage drops down, your panels will drop down. But I think if you want to go, so my recommendation might be, and I'm going to mess with the system and put it through its paces and stuff and see how it works. But there's things like that that are really interesting. An EcoFlow, I'm, I'm installing an EcoFlow smart home panel. Yeah. You can plug solar directly into that battery. No one needs to know anything about it. You're just powering your house. The EcoFlow says, okay, he's using that much energy. I have solar produced. And, and those are kind of off-grid solutions, right? They're not permanent. They're not, I can't feed energy back to the grid. I'm just using energy in my own house. And maybe it's the net zero goal. Maybe it's just not trusting what they might do in the future if they, you know, they penalize solar here. Um, but there are some other options that could potentially flip that script, remove the salespeople, all the overheads and make this a simpler process. But we shall see. I'll, I'll share more when I, when I find out more. Yeah. And in case people are interested, Ricky is producing this ongoing series about his converting his house to kind of a, a net zero home. I'm, I've already watched your first one, actually first couple videos on this. And I'm really excited to see where you go with it. Because for me, I'm going the opposite direction where it's like I'm building a house. So I'm going at it from brand new build, going at it. I'm not putting solar on my own house. I am paying somebody to do that because I have zero interest to do it myself. And you might be doing yours yourself. So it's like, I love the idea that we're both going at this from very different directions, but we'll probably end up in a very similar place at the end. And it'll be interesting to see how we both get there and what the differences are. Um, I, I completely agree. I'll be referencing you. I know you're you're still a couple of months out from from getting started. So yeah. let's let's figure by the end of the year or early next year. Once you get started, I would be referencing you as like the if you're doing a new build, <laughs> check out this. Here's another interesting way because some of the, the the equation changes. I mean, yep. Getting a little bit of extra insulation when you're building a house, no brainer. Dripping out drywall and doing it later is tedious and very expensive. So the retrofit in a lot of ways, uh, to your point, you said earlier, I'm going to get the roof I want and never worry about it again. That's my philosophy. Like just do it right. Don't, don't skimp because you'll hate the thought of five years from now dealing with something. Right. And so, yeah, the, the retrofit build and new construction, two completely different animals, and it'll be fun to, to compare and contrast. Oh, this just popped in my head. Um, how much energy does your family use every month? Because <laughs> this is another thing that comes up in my comments all the time on my videos. Because whenever I show, it's like, oh, I'm using 950 kilowatt hours a month on average. And people are like, what are you doing? I get most of the comments I get of like, 
what are you doing are from people outside of the US. And so once again, it makes me think of what is what is it is about the US that we use so much power? <laughs> and I want to, I'm not alone in this, am I? It's like, you're probably using a lot of power too. So I'm actually surprised you use that much because I mean, it's just you and your wife. Um, you guys work from home. So you guys yeah. are home all the time doing stuff. Uh, I'm curious. Well, before I answer that, I'm curious, what is it? What is, what's the big hog in your house? Does that include all your car charging, by the way? Includes everything, car charging. Oh, everything. that's not, that's not too bad. Cause I mean, the car is probably what? hundred kilowatt hours a month, at least. Minimum. Yeah. It's around there. Maybe more. It's, yeah. The, the most stuff is our air, central air conditioning and furnace system. It's like, that is the biggest bulk of our use. Like half Do of it easily. <laughs> so it's like, so in the summertime though, you're using natural gas, correct? No, in the summertime we're using all electric cause it's air conditioning and the wintertime it's natural gas for the heat, but it's still got the the fan and the system. The running. fan, yeah. Okay. So it's like, yeah, sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, we're, we're, we've got that the blend, but it's, so it's like in the summertime we're using a lot of electricity. So yeah. So I I will say I think the the perspective that I lack, and maybe I need to go travel to where you are, or like Arizona. I, I get comments from like people from Arizona, Nevada, the high desert. Is <laughs> the HVAC your your heating and cooling is basically uh, is it fair to say fifty percent, right? Mm -hmm. But for us, it's zero. I, I told you yesterday when I was chatting with you in San Diego, I, I don't need air conditioning or heating about yeah. 320 days a year. There's 40 days when it's hot enough to really need the air conditioning and cold enough to need the heater. Maybe I'm exaggerating. At least 300 days, we use neither. In fact, my furnace, I, I hope it turns on because we haven't used it in either direction um, since like January. There was a cold week or two there. And this has been an unseasonably cool month but so that does explain a little bit more for you for me i have two kids right i have a wife and then i have our business and our you know we have a team of two editors that are working out of the office so we use about a thousand kilowatt hours a month as well okay and i did the math and i made a video about this but our pool pump runs on two thousand watts and our the people who went about the house they told us to run it for seven hours a day so I, I dumped that to about three hours a day with this pool robot that runs on electricity and he does a great job of keeping the pool clean. So we've reduced our usage down to about 1,900 or so. And that, those bills are killing us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wager that I pay much more for that 900 than you do. Oh, yeah. You um, definitely our do. bills are brutal um, yeah. for sure. But yeah, it's, I've always said electricity is the future. So everything in your house now, like in your new house, are you going to go natural gas or, or electricity for heating and cooling and stuff? electric everything heat yeah, electric everything. everything it's going to be 100 percent electric so we're basically taking everything we used to do we used to pump gas at some place we used to have natural gas for heating and we're moving everything to electricity so i mean it just it becomes really important that solar is the the backbone right i mean solar is well positioned to play into the future and i think natural gas isn't have your natural gas prices kind of soared mine have They've gone up. Yeah, they've been going yeah. up along with the electric. It's like at what we're sure. paying 30 cents a kilowatt hour right now. Like what, what is it where you are? I know it's, you probably have time of use rates, though. Uh, we do. I, I haven't switched over yet. My new house, I'm petrified to call the company. I feel like if they hear my <laughs> voice, they're like, all right, too late. We switched to some horrible new plan and it, it'll cost me even more. But yeah, ours are probably closer to 40. But yeah, you're, you're at 30. Oof. It's not terrible. In the summertime, though, that'll jump to 56 from 4 to 9 p.m. for people on oh time of use. Gosh. I get people so you, from you, Iowa. You basically, you have to be Amish. You have to yeah. just get some candles. and. There's comments from people like in Nebraska. Like I have family out in Iowa, but they comment like, I'm only paying 12 cents a kilowatt hour. It's like, oh, <laughs> must be nice. <laughs> I haven't seen those prices yeah. ever. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but for me, it's part, it's, that's only part of the equation, right? There's also the joy of being a little more self-reliant. That's a yeah. big part of it for me. The me thought too. of like my house is this kind of fortress where you know we make our own energy. There's just something alluring about that. So I've always had other interests, but yeah, people's interests can vary for sure. That's awesome. Well, I do want to thank you again for joining me today. It's an awesome conversation about solar that we just had. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed to Ricky's 2-Bit Da Vinci channel, do it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to your house build and seeing how that pan, plans, uh, pans out. And I really did like your most recent video about the, uh, the flume energy, the, the flume water meter that you put in there and how you track down some leaks that you didn't expect it's a good video definitely worth checking out can i bring up one more thing yeah absolutely so you're moving i moved uh seven months ago people yeah. probably also have asked you about like you know is it worth it you know 
I've gotten comments from people thinking that like adding solar is going to suddenly make your house like double the value. It's not. And I've also gotten people saying that like they're useless. Nobody will buy it. No, no. (laughs) Having solar is a huge motivation for people because that's one less headache for them to deal with. You've already done all the work. Yep. And for me, my, my power wall and, and solar raised my values by about $30,000 when I sold my house. That was kind of the number. That's your personal experience with selling a house with solar and a battery. And my house sold more quickly because of it. Cause I had yeah. some comps of other houses and I was thinking, damn, that's a pretty nice kitchen or that's a, you know, they're probably going to sell first and we beat them to the market because we had solar and they didn't. Yeah. I'm expecting to see something similar with my place when I go to sell it. Well, again, thank you for uh, joining me today, Ricky. And if you'd like to support the show for all of you listening and watching, please consider reviewing us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you listen. And if you'd like to support us more directly, you can go to still tbd.fm and click on the Become a Supporter button to throw a few coins at our heads, as Sean likes to say. You can also click on Join on the YouTube channel and become a member there. So thanks for watching and listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.